Hi everyone. Good evening and welcome to the Sussex Politics Society. If you're joining us for the first time, my name is Mardi and I'm the president. This is our first event of the new year and we're delighted to welcome the award-winning economist, journalist and broadcaster, Evan Davis. Evan joined the BBC in 1993 and went on to become its economics editor in 2001, whilst also becoming an instantly recognisable figure as host of the popular programme Dragon's Den. He then took over from Jeremy Paxman as host of Newsnight, where he provided in-depth investigation and analysis on the current affairs of the day, interviewing figures such as Noam Chomsky, Robert Mugabe and David Cameron and has since been the lead presenter for Radio 4's PM programme, where he was earlier this afternoon. And we're very grateful that he's agreed to skip his dinner to join us tonight. <laughs> Today's event will involve some opening remarks uh, from Evan, uh, then a conversation between Evan and myself on several different subjects, followed by an audience Q&A. Now, how's that going to work? If you have any questions during the event, you should put them in the comment section below the video. We'll have a look, we'll pick some, and we'll make sure that we ask Evan. And that's it from me. So Evan, welcome to the Politics Society. Marty, thank you so much. And it is uh, a great privilege to be talking to you at the weirdest time in my lifetime by far, and I'm decades older than all of you. And I'm gonna do two things. I wanna just make a general comment to you about where we are. But I also want to just talk a little about um, news, fake news and lies, because they're a big part of my life. And I wrote a book about them. Uh, three years ago and I want to uh, I want to give you some views on that just to sort of get us going but before I do I just I have to tell you what I think about Covid and students and I, I think you are incredibly unlucky this is not a great time to be trying to study using technology like this and you're not getting the same opportunities to mix together and drink together and party together as lots of other cohorts of students but there is one thing that I think you do have that people of my generation didn't have from having this COVID experience now, which is you are truly going to have more perspective on so many aspects of life here on out. Believe me, I spent a lot of my economics career reporting on 0.2% growth or inflation going up one, you know, 0.3% in a month or you know, we've got a shock, a, a decline in GDP of 0.3. And, and I think COVID is just giving a sort of meaning to everything of a kind that uh, I, 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 I wish I'd had it earlier. So you're really unlucky to have all of this, but believe me, you will benefit from it and you will go out stronger. So good luck with that. Um, no, let me talk a little about fake news because it's actually, it's a really interesting area. My background is economics. You're in the politics society. And there's a, little, there's a little bit of intersection between economics and politics when it comes to lying. Because economists have a theory, okay, more an assumption than a theory, that no one should lie. Um, because no one would rationally ever believe anyone that's lying. If Donald Trump says X and it's not true, no one would believe it. And so broadly speaking, economists just do not believe that in a rational world, if, if no one would believe the liar, then the liar won't waste his breath or her breath telling the lies. And so lies just don't exist in the rational world. That's where economists start. And it's such a kind of, it's obviously bonkers. People do lie, <laughs> we do observe that. Um, but it's a really interesting contrast to the kind of the irrational theory, which I bet most of you have, which is that liars tell a lie. The world is full of gullible fools who just believe the rubbish they're told. And then they act accordingly. So Donald Trump says, you know, I've done, I'm brilliant. Everyone says, oh, he says he's brilliant, you know, and they clap and then vote for him. Um, and I actually think the economist's view of it is probably more accurate than the, than the sort of political view of it. I don't think the public are fools. And I don't think the public believe everything that they're told. So I think what's interesting, and what I try to do a bit in the book, which was called Post-Truth, I think what's interesting is to ask, why do people lie? Economists say you wouldn't lie because it's a waste of time, no one will believe you in a rational world. Um, 
Is it that the public are stupid? Uh, could be, and there are clearly some stupid people who'll believe the lies. Or is there other stuff going on that makes lies an important communication tool, quite apart from actually getting people to believe the things that you're saying? And that's what I try and do in the book. And I, I'll just give you some of the things. I mean, I think there are ways in which telling lies can work or spinning evidence or the way you present things can sometimes work. You can put lipstick on a pig and it may smarten the pig up a bit and it may get you a better price for the pig. I think there are circumstances you can do that. And they're kind of familiar. <laughs> you know, I would really recommend that you all go away and read some behavioral economics, uh, the study of our kind of irrational impulses. Uh, or Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winning economist, who wasn't even an economist, he was a psychologist. Fantastic book called Fast Thinking, Slow Thinking, about the way we, we can be manipulated by clever people who know the way into our brain and who can engage in psycholo psychological operations, psyops, to, 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 to mislead us, you know. And, and, and these, things, these techniques do work. So they, there's a bit of that. So there's a bit of human beings are a bit dim and you can manipulate them. Okay, there's a bit of that. But I think there are some other things. I think there are some other things going on. And I think you should, I think you should think about it. In, in your thinking about politics. And by far the most important, which is the one I want to focus on here, is people telling lies, not to persuade people of the, of the truth, but to say something about who they are and whose side they're on, to express political allegiance, really. And I think in understanding the Trump phenomenon and why Trump supporters never seem to be dissuaded in their support for him, uh, whether he says things that are true or palpably false. It's, I think, because his lies, his falsehoods, are a form of political signaling about this is who I am, this is who I'm for, and this is who I'm against. So in the book, I go into one which is about a lie about unemployment in the US, where he said unemployment is 40%, which is clearly not true. Um, but I think that that signaled lots of things. It had a kind of, it was an underlying truth about who he wanted to tell he was supporting. People on the margins of unemployment and the like. So I think my kind of political message with an, from an economic background is that lies, more often than not, the economists are right. Lies are not about persuading people of falsehoods. Sometimes, yes, more often, they're about saying who you are and about kind of shaping a, a, a vision of yourself, and a tribal allegiance. And I'll just finish by saying, virtually all the time, actually, we tend to, to view facts as a way of affirming our belief system <laughs> rather than believing the fact. We park our critical faculties all over the place when we are in an argument. So on Brexit, um, you could see on both sides there was belief in stuff that wasn't true. And that wasn't because, you know, people were persuaded by stupid lies. It was just that, you know, when Boris Johnson said something about Brexit that wasn't true, it wasn't that it persuaded Remainers that they should be leavers. It was more that it energized leavers in their belief. And their belief in the untruth would become, if you like, a kind of a way of confirming their allegiance to that Brexit support system. And if, if statistically most of you are Remainers, which would be probably true given the, uh, the data we have on young people and student preferences, um, here's a warning. Even you probably believe lots of crap uh, because it just reaffirms your worldview and your kind of your value system. And you will believe the worst of somebody who is a political enemy, and you won't employ your critical faculty in that, uh, in, in, in coming to that assessment, your assessment, you'll just believe it. So my sort of, my view is, is that lies are much less about partaking of, participating in the spread of false information, although there is a lot of that. A lot of it's about tribalizing us, setting us into camps, showing which team I am, I'm in, 
and which team you're in. And that kind of, that psychology of lies is why we have so many of them, rather than that, when someone says it costs 350 million a week to be in the EU, people literally swallow that up and believe it. So that's my kind of, my picture of lies, which I think has a, I think the most important thing is you've just got to explain why people apparently believe so many untrue things. And I don't think it does ever just to assume people are dim or stupid. We know that there are stupid people, but I think as a kind of, as a phenomenon to kind of describe half the population or the, or, or, or the bulk of the population, I think it, it doesn't do. So those are my initial reflections, Madi, on um, that's a sort of very, very potted summary of the important message from the book um, about post-truth and why there is so much lie. Uh, maybe a little more optimistic than some other people in believing that people on the whole don't believe rubbish, even if they, they sign up to it. Right, thanks very much, Evan. And so you talked about the book, and if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask you to reflect just a little bit further. And you wrote about it in 2017. I'm gonna say the full title of the book, which is Post-Truth, Why We Have Reached Peak Bullshit and What We Can Do About It. I thought it was a really good depiction of the situation as it was then and how it would change over the course of um, the next few years. And in fact, I think it's fair to say that many of the tenets and the things that you've talked about then have become perhaps more prevalent. So I wanted to ask you about that peak bullshit and specifically in light of the pandemic, so much skepticism about so many different things, science included, has that peak reached even higher? Yeah, well, I started writing the book actually in about 2012 and we, we had this vision of peak bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then it kind of, it keeps getting into a new, a new, a new second, a new wave of, uh, of ever greater height. Um, well, I actually, I think the pandemic is very interesting. I think the pandemic is slightly different. I, I think people, human beings have responded to pandemics historically in a number of different ways. Some they kind of go kind of, it's time to party, it's all nonsense. Some tend to go and um, become incredibly scared and lock themselves in, 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 in the attic. Some, some, come, some kind of put their faith in God or in, 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 in something else. Um, and then you'll, you get some who say it's a punishment or some, some kind, This we brought this upon ourselves. So you get the kind of moralist. And these, I think, have been found through the ages. And we see a little bit of all of them around at the moment. I mean, I, I, I'm unashamedly someone who, who thinks the science is really helpful in all of these things. And I, I've not been put off the science. But I think what's, what has allowed there to be so much, if you like, dissent on this are two things. One is that... The, science, the scientists are in a bit of a fog themselves. They're always working things through. Life isn't full of certainty. And so the uncertainties allowed, allowed there to be legitimate debates. And, and, and so you've had leg legitimate debates. So that's one. The other thing that I think is really important and really important to the way you think about this country is we have quite an argumentative and feisty political culture. And we... We like to argue, and our media culture is quite adversarial. So we, by and large, you know, whatever is happening, there will be an argument over it, okay? And so I noticed today there were headlines about the government's bought a lot of ventilators. We're not even using them. They paid a lot of money for them, like that this was some gigantic mistake <laughs> um, because these are pre pre preparation for if it gets worse. Um, and I find myself thinking, no, I, I, I really can't get cross about them paying a lot of money for ventilators. To me, that seems like good housekeeping, you know, to, to buy ventilators. But when there weren't enough ventilators, there were arguments that there aren't enough ventilators. And then we've got too many ventilators. And there's a kind of, there's a kind of cloying adversarialism to all of it, which is just the feisty argumentative culture, political culture in which we live. And so I think that has, if you like, been a playing a big part in the British response to the pandemic. So look, that we're generally argumentative. We went in anyway with a lot of very basic visions over, over, over values in culture and ethics. And, uh, and then you add on a lot of scientific uncertainty and you've got a, a recipe for, for quite a lot of arguments. I see that as a pretty natural outcome. 
I see we've just received a question in uh, the comment section, and I was going to wait to ask these until the end, but it just so happens to come from my academic advisor, so I feel obliged to ask it now. <laughs> and so I'm a science student. Uh, my academic advisor is a professor in the life sciences school, and his question is, how do we get people to believe in the proper science? Right. So I I I, I cover this a bit in the book, actually, and not not perhaps as clearly as as he or she would like, but. Um, the way to get people to believe in the science usually is to be honest. There's no shortcut to getting a reputation for truthfulness. You get a reputation for truthfulness by being honest. And Donald Trump has a reputation for being untruthful. And, you know, that is because people have spotted a pattern. So the first piece of advice is be honest. And that particularly means when it comes to the science of being open about your uncertainties. And so where the politicians, I think, have got it wrong sometimes in this pandemic is the over-promising and under-delivering, saying something that then turns out not to be true. And they might have tried that for a very legitimate reason to keep it simple or to give people hope and to make them feel good spirited. But I don't think the scientists should do any of that the scientists should be upfront. We don't know this, we do think this, this is what we recommend, or this is what we think the choices are. And all I think the scientists can do is to be as honest as possible and, and not to themselves spin or to never to lie. Um, because I think as soon as people feel they're being, if you like, spun to or sold to, they will begin to push push away. Um, so I think it's honestly my advice to everybody is always just be as honest as you can if you've got the time. And, you know, I was doing a, a presentation on a number of these dinners to people in the city. I, I quote this a lot. And they said, how can we improve the image of the city? We have a terrible public image. The, the, the banks, nobody likes the banks. What's wrong with us? You're a journalist. Tell us how to improve our image. And I always just say to if you've got a bad image and you're bad, it's not an image problem that you have. And scientists, you know, you just have to be completely honest. I don't even think, by the way, scientists do have a bad image, but I think you, um, scientists, just be honest. And by the way, don't expect to persuade everybody. You don't need to persuade everybody. You only need to persuade the bulk of sensible or reasonable people who are open to persuasion and, um, you know, not to try and uh, to think that you're going to persuade every last person with a conspiracy theory that they're wrong. And I mean, you know, Mahdi, never argue with a conspiracy theorist because it, it doesn't get you anywhere. And so scientists don't even try doing that. It's, it's, it's not going to help. There definitely seems to have been an increase in the uptake of conspiracy theorists, especially in the US and the UK, yes, but also yeah. Um, in the US. And so I was going to ask about the economy, but after last night, I'd feel remiss if I didn't ask about um, the event that everybody's talking about. Did you catch the debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden? I'm afraid I, I didn't stay up, but I watched, uh, actually, I listened to quite a lot while walking the dog, Mr. Whippy, this morning. He had a long walk, um, but I can't say I saw it from beginning to end, but I've, I've had a lot, of, a lot of clips, read a lot about it, and listened to quite a bit of it first half. What did you think? Um, well, I'm, <clears throat> I've been pondering on it all day, and my actual feeling is a lot of people thought the debate was too noisy and shouty, which it clearly was. It was very ragged. But I've, I've come to think that that has information in itself, that when you watch the debate, again, it, it comes back to don't take the, lang the, the, uh, the points made too literally, okay? You're, you're not judging the politicians just by the quality of their arguments in the debate. You're also judging them by the way they behave and by the way they conduct themselves. And don't underestimate that. And I, I think probably the, the consensus today seems to be that Donald Trump overdid it in certain ways for his own good. And it's not about the arguments, it's about the conduct. And so in a funny kind of way, the thing that everybody has criticized about the debate, the shoutiness of it, and the failure of the you know, chairman, Chris Wallace, to, to hold it together and to shut them up. 
that I think turned out to be the most revealing thing about the um, about the debate. So I, I um, I think it was quite quite testing. Now there's a there, there is an argument which is a bit like never argue with a conspiracy theorist, which is don't try and argue with Donald Trump because you won't get it. Um, but I. You know, you might have thought, well, maybe there shouldn't be any more debates. They're just going to shout at each other. But I rather think, actually, that, that that did turn out to be an interesting test. And it was a test for Joe Biden. And it's a test for him as to how he reacts. And it's a test for Donald Trump. Because next time, um, he has to calibrate his behavior to what he thinks is going to impress the voters. Uh, so, so I thought it was actually, very, I think it was very, very interesting, very interesting. But the least interesting thing about it were the actual arguments, because it's just such a fatuous way of trying to get actual arguments made. It just dots from one topic to another, and there's no really kind of zoning in on a particular proposition and, you know, pursuing it to the end. You just, they, they just sort of, you know, bounce around saying stuff and it hitting, mm. hitting the wall behind the other. It's interesting you say that, talking about not as much as of a focus on the points as it is on the personalities in a way. And it reminds me of um, the Richard Nixon, John F. Kennedy debate in 1960, how that was the first televised debate. And for everyone that listened uh, to it on the radio, everybody thought that Richard Nixon won. Yeah. That's what the poll said. Famously, and everybody yeah. who watched it uh, thought that John Kennedy won the debate. And I, I suppose it begs the question as if it turns into essentially a pageant of sorts where they're out parading their personalities as opposed to their policies uh, or perhaps avoiding questions instead of giving um, straightforward answers. What benefit does it give a democratic election? What benefit does it give a democracy to have debates like these? Look, it's, it's back to the stuff I was saying at the beginning. People want to know not what's your view of the individual mandate in the healthcare system. They, they do want to know that, and, and that will be important to some. But most people are basically, in a democracy, quite reasonably thinking to themselves, who here shares my basic values? Who here is on my side? Who here will think of my problems in the same way that I think about my problems? Who of the candidates do I want to win? And you know, it, it, it would be mad to think that the individual voter is going to come to a view on all sorts of technicalities. People are allowed to vote, you know, not, oh, I like the hairstyle or that's a nice tie, but they're allowed to vote perfectly sensibly on the basis of, of who comes across best to them. And, you know, politics is... It's not about the laws that you're going to pass. I mean, of course, it's a, to some extent. It's about how you're reacting to events, about how you, what kind of person you are, what your behavioral function is. And so for me, it just seems silly to think that in a democracy, people are going to vote on reading manifestos and going through them line by line, saying I'm closer to this one or that one. They're making visceral decisions about which of the candidate represents their, their value system. And, and that, for me, is what democracy is about. And they will, some of them will be incredibly tribal about it, and some will be C pluses and minuses in each candidate and come to a vote, you know, come to a decision about which one overall they prefer. Okay. But I, I, I actually think, you know, it matters whether the person elected um, is a bully or is doddery or is... Um, you know, you know, any number of other characteristics. These are things that are perfectly legitimate to vote on. So I, I think those, it's fine that in a debate, those things are litigated as well as, the, uh, as well as the policies. It's not a court of law. In a court of law, it really is about the facts. It really is about, did this person do that at that time on that day? In, in politics, it's not. It's about a judgment about who over the next court, four years is going to, or five years in this country, who's going to, Who's going to, who do I want to be guiding us, you know, and, and in all sorts of new crises and responding to all sorts of new events, you know. While we're on the topic, actually, of the election, we've got another audience question that I think um, is quite relevant. And that is, well, we've got a hello to you from uh, Jordan and Isaac. Uh, but their question is, um, who do you think came off as the real winner from last night? Well, I'm told that um, Joe Biden did. 
I have to say it wasn't that clear cut to me, but I'm told that the I'm told that the um, undecideds went for Biden. Um, and I think the answer is that Donald Trump looked bullying and looked like he it didn't it looked like he wasn't willing to play by the rules and he it, and, and I think the perception was he went too far in that direction and that his base love him for all of that. They love him to be the outsider who doesn't play by the rules, but there are a lot of undecided voters who perhaps do want someone who doesn't talk over the opponent all the time. And broadly speaking, in the election, persuading undecided people to vote for you is quite an important thing you have to do. Um, not the only thing, you've got to get your, your base out to vote, but persuading undecided to be part of your vote is very important. And on that measure, I think um, I think Trump lost. But I don't think I don't think it was I don't think it was game changing. I think Biden is going to win. You know, I mean, you, you look at polls; Biden is way ahead. So, um, you know, Trump has it, Trump is the one who has to get to find some utterly game changing uh, event because uh, because otherwise Biden wins. Right. And one of the things they discussed yesterday was the recession, the economy, and I know that's a subject very close to your heart. So let's switch to economics. Mm. Is this worse than 2008? Much worse. Um, now, first, there's one area in which it isn't worse, um, which was that 2008 was a crisis that was the result of some economic imbalances that had, that had been accumulated. And so we didn't just have to resolve the crisis. We also needed to work our way out of some of those imbalances. And those are really to do with um, the economy being fueled by too much growth in credit and debt. So we were keeping the economy going, but it was but the debt levels were rising too fast and we had to stop that. And we had the crisis to deal with. So that was a kind of a chronic problem as well as an acute one. It was a, a problem of a sort of a build up problem as well as the acute problem of the crisis. But this crisis is much, much deeper. Um, hopefully will be you know, less of an economic rupture in, um, it, it's not reflecting, you know, something we did wrong economically, apart from perhaps failing to put enough money into pandemic preparation, but it's more a reflection of, but it's just so much deeper. It's, it's just off the scale deep, you know, a 20% reduction in quarterly GDP and a 25% reduction in working hours, hours worked, the dislocation to, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of small businesses, the, um, you know, the knock-on effects in, in, in so many industries. I mean, you know, not, every, not everything has been hit, but so many industries have been hit. Um, and the bills that we built up in, 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 in trying to keep things on the road during it, all of these are just sort of, you know, amazing to me. Um, it, 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 is, it is huge. And, you know, we will be, We'll be picking up the, the pieces for a bit because it's um, it, it is very big. Now, I mean, look, I think the central case, which is not too bad, is we'll get a vaccine next year, and we will be going back to something much closer to life as normal after that. But um, on that central assumption, which would be sort of you know summer next year, we could perhaps go back to something more normal. Um, we're going to have. We're going to have it'll. It, we're going to have a lot of job destruction, a lot of company destruction, and you know companies are fragile and important entities, and their collections of workers and employers and capital and property and ideas and intellectual property, and to break them up into their disparate parts is is incredibly sad, and we'll have a lot of that. So I think it's going to be a really it's going to be really destructive um and the only upside muddy the only upside really is that out of this kind of destruction often some fantastic new shoots will grow and i'm i'm sure they will but let's be quite clear you know there's just going to be a lot of economic destruction heartbreaking people's mm -hmm. life work going into a business that's just been wiped out you know by the uh, by the, the lockdown or the, or, or, or the pandemic. 
So these shoots that are going to regrow, these pieces that we're going to pick up, how big are they going to be? And uh, what does this recovery, at least in your opinion, look like? Well, I actually think the recovery will be quite quick, but the pandemic is quite slow. So I, uh, you know, no, it's, we're not going to get the recovery until we've cleared and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get something of a recovery. So that's not fair. We've had a bounce back. We've had a good, um, we have had quite a big recovery, but we're not going to get a, a proper recovery until we know sort of where things are going to be. So look, Marty, you want companies to say, hey, here's something we can do. Let's put lots of money in this. Or, hey, look, the Cornish tourist industry has been eviscerated. Actually, it hasn't been, it's been probably quite strong, but for example, that the, the tourist industry has been given a hit. Let's build a let's build a new factory there um, because there'll be you know unemployment there. We can soak up the workers. But if no one's, I just I don't really feel people will do much of that that kind of rebuilding until the world is on a more stable footing and we're not like lockdown Friday here and on Thursday it's over here and um, oh it's a it's a second wave. I just it, it just is. It's all too insecure for people to throw lots of money at things. So um, I really wish, I, I, you know, I'm just wishing we can get out of this as fast as possible. And we're not going to be in this kind of constant pensive state as to what the heck is about to happen and what's going to hit us and what are the figures today. So, I, I, you know, there has been a good bounce back. It really did bounce back quite a long way, but we're way down from where we were and we will be for a while. So let's fast forward to the end of that waiting period. Let's say we've come back. I think you know, the challenges that we may face economically are, are really interesting. And one that I want to talk about is, well, a century ago, the most valuable commodity in the global market uh, was oil, because that's what the world runs on. Now it seems like the world runs on a different kind of resource. Um, but in this case, the new oil, um, it's not oil. It's not even a physical uh, substance. It's data. And so these titans of the digital age, uh, you've got Google, Amazon, Apple, uh, Facebook, Microsoft, they look pretty unstoppable. And so with your economics cap on, I suppose, what do you foresee uh, happens next? Um, yeah, they, they do look unstoppable. So the, the first thing I would say, um, just the first thing I would say is that often one day is unstoppable, are, are amazingly stoppable thereafter. So I, I, you know, there was a Guardian piece, which I, someone quoted, and I did check it out, it's real, about MySpace, which none of you have heard of, and how MySpace is going to monopolize the world. And sometimes things that look incredibly invincible turn out to be very flimsy. And so tides turn much faster than you think for companies, and companies do um, look in, so it was, um, it was IBM in the, in, in, in the 1980s, and everyone was like, "How? who's going to control IBM, and is it going to take over the world? No, no, no one cares about IBM now. Um, there is a very natural monopoly <laughs> feel to things like Facebook, um, uh, because I want to be on the same social media platform that you're on. I don't want to be on my, on my own on one. So there's once you've got everybody on it, it's very hard to persuade them to move. But even there, there's, there is some contestability. And it may well be everyone will grow tired of Facebook and the, the money will go. But my, my broad view is, is that if it turns out that the company isn't so vulnerable, the consumers stick with it and love it and won't go away and don't rip, and no one comes up with a competitor, competitor that can, can wean people off the old one into the new, Broadly speaking, the world reaches an accommodation with these big agents, these big agents, uh, organizations by regulation and uh, exerting accountability and authority over them. So I would see, I really would see uh, governments doing something about it if they feel it's getting out of hand. Um, right. I, I think that's where I am. Uh, it, you know, that, that if these companies really make, <laughs> if the abuses don't improve, uh, then, then, then people will, will, will stop it, you know, from the outside. 
Um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. I mean, already you've got more than one, right? So, I mean, Amazon is a phenomenally important company because it crosses so many sectors. All the people who actually make stuff that is sold through Amazon are subject to them. I think it's it took to it, and that makes it perhaps the most important. Facebook is obviously the um, data, uh, the, the one that I think people have worried about data on uh, most, given the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, Apple, very different kind of set of problems, monopoly problems to Facebook. And, um, you know, the reason people buy Apple a lot of the time is they do actually like the product. And then Google, well, you know, yeah, I suppose Google is a is is, is an interesting one. But I don't. I think for people in Google, it, they never feel like it's as, they're as powerful and monolithic as everybody outside Google thinks they are. Um, yeah, but I think regulation will come or economic economic um, control. Yeah, I just uh, broadly speaking, the world isn't that stable. If you go back and look at the stock market in the UK in the nineteen eighties and now, a lot of the names are very very different. ICI is in there, Imperial Tobacco. You, you know, there is a quite a bit of turnover, quite a bit of turnover. Right. I'd just like to clarify one of the claims that you made earlier. I was, in fact, five years old when MySpace was founded, and I have some <laughs> recollection of it. Not very <laughs> thorough, but some. Um, two more questions for me, and then I'll um, hand it over to the audience. We seem to have a fair few coming in. Okay. Um, start of the month, I don't know if you um, got one of the Extinction Rebellion set up blockades of a few of the printing presses owned by uh, papers, or run by papers owned by Rupert Murdoch. And there was considerable criticism of this, that while it may have been with the best of intentions, it was in a way stifling freedom of the press. I wanted to ask, what does freedom of the press mean to you? Um, well, I, I, I think it means the freedom to, yeah, it's. It, I don't think it means complete freedom to say whatever you want. Um, so you can't, and, and we don't have free press in that regard. We don't allow me to say stuff that is untrue about other people and defamatory or confusing. Um, for me, freedom of the press is, it's a very, very interesting question. Look, freedom of speech is people can talk any amount of rubbish that they want within certain constraints. The famous one is you can't shout fire in a crowded theater, okay? So that's, so, but apart from that, freedom of speech is you can say what you want. You can go on social media and say what you want. No. Nah. The press, I think, there's a little more responsibility on the press because the press have generally had some privileges. Um, we, just to give you one example, there's a lower rate of VAT on newspapers than there is on other products. So I think with those privileges, there's a little bit of responsibility and an expectation of responsibility. Um, I don't think one would say taking a negative view of the science of climate change would be something that would, you know, we should curtail. But that to me seems incorrect scientifically, but not so illegitimate that it's like, shouting fire in a crowded theater or libeling someone. If people want to give crank, you know, crank theories of what's going on, they can give crank theories of what's going on. Um, I, 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 broadly speaking, prefer to have faith in the public that they will tend to gravitate towards the truth. And I, I, I am optimistic about people. I think people get very tribal in their beliefs. In America, climate change has become tribalized that people won't believe it because that they think that makes them a, 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 a Trump supporter or um, so that, that's unfortunate. But uh, I think the way out of that is, is, is to just make sure you, you have some decent media that tells the truth and is, 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 is tries not to be, uh, you know, too cranky about things. Um, so I guess that's, that's, I mean, that's a very rambling answer, Mardi, but I, I don't have anything very sophisticated to say about it. I think people should be free by and large to publish and people should be free to buy whatever they want within some, some very kind of well-defined constraints, which we do have. Um, I don't by and large think I should stop you 
I don't think I should stop you saying what you believe. Um, you know, that's just, I think it's just a way, it's not so much a way of getting to the truth, it's just much more a way of make sure, making sure that we, that we conduct ourselves well with regard to each other. Just in case I'm wrong, maybe you're right, so I shouldn't stop you saying what you think, because I, I, I may be wrong. I'm just going to cough. Right, so <laughs> final question for me before we... <laughs> Go on. Well, here's hoping. So the final question for me before we hand over, and this one I'll admit is a question uh, mainly for myself. And you interviewed a great number of people. I listed a few at the start: uh, Noam Chomsky, Robert Mugabe, uh, former Prime Minister David Cameron, and our current Prime Minister back when he was just the Mayor of London. When you think of the favorite, your favorite person to interview, or the best interview that you've done, does anybody come to mind? And as a follow up to that. And this is more for me. What do you think makes a good interview? Right. So um, Warren Buffett is the guy who comes to my mind. Warren Buffett is one of the world's richest men. He's an investor in the US. He's phenomenally successful. Without any doubt at all, Warren Buffett is the best investor that has ever existed anywhere on anything. He has a track record that has more or less from relatively you know, ordinary upbringing has allowed him to, um, to, to, to create hundreds of billions of, of, accumulate hundreds of billions of dollars of value. He's an incredibly generous guy, gives billions of it away, intends to give most of it away when he dies. It happens also to be a lovely guy who lives in an ordinary house and drives an ordinary car and doesn't live the dream that many of the others would, uh, would be wanting would aspire to so he's just a nice guy he lives in omaha nebraska and i interviewed him for about an hour and it was a piece really on what was interesting about it we made a documentary out of it because it was really more about how to be rich in a in, in a really admirable way and not to be kind of not to lose yourself in the money because he's really remained very very grounded and he's also done something wonderful which is He's been modest. He doesn't think he deserves it. He thinks he's bloody good at what he does, but he doesn't think that's a particularly valuable skin. He has this lovely line about, the, you know, if I was a lion, if, if I was in if I was in prehistoric times and the lion was chasing me, uh, I probably wouldn't be very well adapted to that particular, you know, particular environment. I, and, and if I said to the lion, I'm great at investing, I look, I'm allocating capital between different investments. <laughs> and just eat him all the time. So that was a good, a good interview. And why it was a good interview, I'll give you a number of things that make a good interview. A good interviewee who just speaks plainly, openly, and honestly is, is the best thing you can have for an interview. I think the other things that make for a good interview are stories. Anyone interviewing anybody or doing interviews, doing interviews or conducting interviews human beings relate to stories and stories are the unit of human knowledge and understanding and this gets us back to facts it's it, it's less about the truth value of the story it's more about the choice of story that you tell and so i really would um recommend everyone think of stories stories make interviews vignettes little tales accounts of what happened next what then happened. So that makes a great interview. And then when you're talking about something a bit more, a bit more kind of day-to-day -day PM program, Newsnight Today program, I guess in those interviews, there are a lot of good things you can do. I think a good argument is great for an interview. It's not my style. What I prefer my style to be is around being curious and genuinely inquisitive to understand where they're coming from. So all styles have, have their merit. So one interview is you come across the politician and you ask them, why are you so useless? Um, and that makes for a good argument and is often very cathartic to the viewers who see the politician being beaten up. Um, my style would be tend to be more, so what were you thinking when you decided to do that? Why? Was that going to work? I mean, that looks a bit stupid because what, so it's a bit sort of a bit more kind of curious rather than adversarial. 
there have been lots of styles work, but by and large, the best interviews that you actually want to hear are stories, keep telling stories. Right. Well, that's the questions from me done. So uh, now we'll move over to the audience ones. We don't have loads of time, so I'll just pick a couple. And so we'll start off with uh, one from Edward, uh, which says, can you see a society where data and public attention is no longer the central commodity? And I'd just like to add on that and ask if you have any ideas of what the next big commodity could be. Um, well, I mean, I think maybe I'm just in pandemic mode. So I think a whole lot of things around life sciences and, <laughs> and gene manipulation are going to turn out to be phenomenally valuable and phenomenally, um, phenomenally important. So that's where I would be thinking next in answer to Edward. Um, will we be in a point where data, data isn't king? I mean, I... I suppose I, I, I'm kind of imagining in my head we're going to reach the end of how useful data can be, you know, that as much as is usefully datable will have been um, mined and, and processed and we'll start finding ourselves, I mean, you know, unless you simply define data and data handling as every cognitive pursuit that we have, um, which I don't. I sort of think you might just reach the end of data. If you think of data as the sort of stuff that we most think, which is Facebook working out how to advertise to us or Tesco's working out what we buy and thus being able to kind of tailor things or companies looking at our shopping habits and being able to, to use the data, the pricing, individually or to um to sell to us in in those kinds of ways i do see that running out a little bit i actually to be to be blunt i i i worry a bit that the kind of that the kind of narrow casting data view of how the world works is a bit overdone so the advertising i get often brilliant I, if i buy a bookcase for the next week i get adverts for bookcases and i can see how clever the data has been at getting but actually i don't want a bookcase i just bought one last weekend i don't need a bookcase um, so we might have reached the limits of that and kind of trying to individually target things to people you know i i i, I think your generation is missing out on some of the iconic ads, the kind of ads that were sort of mind changing and changed our perception of the product, of which the most famous in my sort of time was Nick Kamen advertising 501 jeans, Levi's 501 jeans, you'll find it online. And the ad, everybody saw the ad, it was game changing for jeans and for Levi's. And it became a, it was just an iconic cultural thing. And it never would have happened if someone had been using data to kind of target that. And political messaging, you can go kind of, you can go way overboard on thinking that data is going to get you there. Sometimes a real, and it can distract you from a compelling universal narrative or a story, for God's sake, that appeals to people and changes the game. And so, I think sometimes data is just sort of, it drives everybody into the sort of algorithms and it, 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 it uninspires them. It, it honestly, it uninspires them. And instead of having something big to say, they, uh, they do it all in the data. Um, right. So that's just a big take on data. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm just stuck in the past, but, but look up no, the, Nick Kamen, the, 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 the Levi's 501, Nick Kamen at the laundromat. No, but I'm glad that you brought up um, ads and data mining in that regard, because the next question is related to that. And I'm just going to add, add this onto it before I ask it. So I uh, try and listen to uh, different sites of uh, news or different uh, sort of news headline podcasts first thing in the morning. And I find it so interesting that if you listen to the BBC and you listen to CNN, the biggest difference for me, accents aside, is the music that's playing in the background and the how 
perhaps not aggressive, but how forceful they are when they speak and when they say the news. And you find this persists when you watch uh, any of the programs on the BBC about politics compared to CNN. It, it seems ever so slightly more relaxed or more calm than in the States. And when you watch American television, you do have a feeling of sensory overload sometimes. And so the Absolutely. question is from, from May, from my, sorry, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it. In your opinion, what is the significance of the use of data mining as well as misinformation? and the psychological effects of information overload on citizens, and what are we to do about these phenomena? Right. Um, right. I don't, I don't think there's a lot you can do about it, if I'm honest. I think consumers, that the healthy reaction is for us to be told that there is such a thing as sensory overload, to be told that, and to manage it ourselves. But in, in my book, actually, there's this thing called the Lombard effect, which is the effect of noise in pubs, in, 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 in restaurants, bars. And it's, it's literally this, it's that if other people speak up, we have to speak up in order to be heard. And you get into a dynamic of ever louder, brasher, noisier environment. And you can, you can see that in the kind of the, 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 the American ads and the sort of noisy jangly thing with five things moving around the screen on an American TV news program. You can see that similar thing of a, of a busy street in Tokyo with lights and flashing and everyone saying, hey, look at me, look at me, I'm here, attention seeking. And a lot of the time, I think that cacophony is very appealing. I think we go to bars that are loud precisely because we like the noise. And I think we have to control that. I don't only want to go to bars that are noisy or walk down neon strips with kind of a hundred shops and people on the edge calling me in. And fun as it is, I don't want to only do that. But who, it, it's up to me to decide, is it not? Um, up to me to decide whether or not I, um, I, go into those streets and go into those bars or watch those TV stations. We have to control it. And if you are not personally getting enough zen-like calm and switching out and turning off the phone and taking a walk in the country sometimes, you don't get it. You're doing it wrong because the brain needs the stimulation and it needs the argument and it needs the sense of life and buzz, but it also needs the time to settle down and, 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 and calm down. And I really, I really think it's up to us. And there's no point in saying, what can society do about this? <laughs> All you can do about it is have a lovely bath with some soft music playing and some nice salts or something, some fragrance in there. Or you can put some headphones on and watch one of the million fantastic ASMR videos that, uh, <laughs> that will get you to calm down and give you tingles or take a nice walk in the countryside with someone you love or like. Um, you know, there are a million ways of zoning out and don't expect anyone else to do it for you. And if you're not doing it, you really are, you're not going to make the big inspired, you're not gonna have the big inspired calls um, in your life that you need. You need to be creative and that means giving yourself space in different, giving yourself exposure to different spaces, be it nature, busy neon streets, CNN or the BBC. All right, so just two more and then uh, we'll uh, wrap it up after that. And so this question, there's a few questions on a similar theme. So I've just picked this one and it's from mm -hmm. Billy and it's about mm -hmm. the role of the BBC. And the BBC's, I think it's fair to say there's been a little bit of contention from different political wings about what kind of bias, if any, the BBC has. The left say that it has a right wing bias, the right say it has a left wing bias. Um, but in reality, the BBC is sort of seen as the gold standard for news, at least in this country. And so what is the role of the BBC in countering the rise of fake news? And with this uh, reputation seemingly under fire in, in some uh, manner, what would the appointments of uh, Charles Moore or Paul Dacre, uh, how would they impact it? Okay, good question. I might pass on the second part there because that's, <laughs> that's quite difficult. And it's not, really, it's not really for BBC people to have a view 
on who is put in charge of the corporation. That's up to the um, that's up to the people who pay for it to elect a government, who have an appointments process, which input which is important, which is uh, then put to the prime minister or the government who then make the choice. So, I mean, it, it, it really is over. Um, I'm kind of doubting that, uh, you know, of the board, so to speak, or the chairman of Ofcom, I don't think it's likely that uh, they would see their role as kind of coming in and telling me what to say on the PM programme or, or do this, don't do that. I mean, it, 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 it's not quite how the relationship works. So, I, you know, I, I, that's all I'll say on Charles Moore, Paul Dacre. Um, what's the role of the BBC? I think what the BBC's role is, is to provide something that may, the market may not provide. And what that would be is a news outlet where we really do put premium on accuracy, factual accuracy, um, and where we put a premium on being fair to all sides of an argument, where we don't see it as our job to persuade you of X. We just see it as our job to give you the information to decide on X. It's very legitimate for the Daily Mail to want to campaign and persuade you of something. And it's incredibly legitimate for the Guardian to, you know, to, to do the same or to take a more strident tone uh, about the views and attitudes of half the population. These are all absolutely legit. The BBC, our job is to, it's, 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 it's not to be on the one hand, on the other hand, it is to furnish our viewers and listeners with enough information to make the call that is right for them. And so that's how I see it. In the Brexit referendum, loads of friends of mine, you know, I live in London, graduate friends, you know, they're mostly Remainers. They all said the BBC let the country down by not explaining how bad the idea of Brexit was. And I keep saying is that it really isn't the BBC's job to tell the public, don't vote for Brexit. I mean, it's just a complete misunderstanding the BBC would have let the public down if the public didn't know that most economists think it's not economically helpful to leave the EU. We can't tell the public it's not economically helpful to leave the EU. We can tell the public most economists think that, which is a fact. And we, I think, did tell the public that. Um, and then the public have to decide, do we want to leave the EU? Do we believe those economists or are they, you know, a bunch of uh, snake oil salesmen? And so I think the role of the BBC is just to try and be fair to the sides and to try and to be accurate in what we say. And of course, when society is very divided, people have very different views about what impartiality means and how we express it. I mean, and the BBC does have a problem of being from a relatively narrow, you know, background. Um, so we are based in cities. We are mostly graduates. It is quite young. It also turns out to be quite middle class, white. Um, and so, yeah, there are a whole lot of ways in which the BBC needs to promote diversity. And I think that's well understood at the BBC. But the main thing is we don't get, you know, people to come to the BBC to present a point of view. They'll bring their perspective, but we don't, they're not, they're not, we don't employ them to come and, and, uh, and, and explain, you know, why the public are wrong on this or that. Our job is to furnish people with the tools. And, you know, that, I, think, I think on the whole, we do that quite well. And that is why we're different to lots of newspapers. We do see the points as often to persuade people things. And uh, our job isn't to do that. So I think as long as we're different, providing something different, I think we have a role. Brilliant. And so we're on to our final question, or rather final set of questions, because for the first time in Politics Society history, we're going to be ending off an event with a quick fire round. And so these Thank will you. be 15 seconds or less, but I uh, will let you take a bit longer if you wish to. <laughs> and uh, I've got seven questions for you. And so we'll start with this one. Favorite economist and why? Uh, everybody says John Maynard Keynes. Um, the economist who taught me, employed me, and who is brilliant is John Kay. And he is my favorite economist because I think he has a very intuitive way of looking at at looking at things, 
He's not too technical, but is incredibly rigorous and also very nice. So I'm going to say John Cave. You, you should look out for some of his stuff and, and read it because he's, he's really interesting. Well, if he's watching, I hope he's very happy hearing that. <laughs> Favourite dragon on Dragon's Den? Deborah Meaden. Deborah Meaden. Best pitch you've ever seen? Um, best pitch? Gosh, no, God, that's a really, um, that is a difficult one. Well, the one that I, <clears throat> I suppose it wasn't a particularly successful pitch, but I really <laughs> liked the product and the guy was the Trunky, which is the little the little wheelie suitcase thing for, for toddlers, which they can sit on and put their luggage in. And you see them everywhere in, in airports. Yes. And it was actually quite a good pitch. And he got um, hit by the fact that Theo Pafitas managed to, to pull the strap off. And I mean, that was a very re easily re resolvable problem in my view, but um, <clears throat> they didn't invest. But actually I thought it was a great product. And Rob, uh, uh, Rob um, Law was the, um, the entrepreneur was really, really good. All right. So out of everyone you've interviewed, we've talked about just general um, <clears throat> individuals, but let's look at politicians. Who do you think was the, the most impressive politician? Um, that's a very good question. Probably a bit invidious. I have to be, you know, very impartial. Um, they can be international. Yeah, no, well, like, it's a very, it's a really, really interesting one, actually. Um, <clears throat> I always, in this situation, tend to come back to, to kind of Kenneth Clark, who I think has a very good interview style, but that doesn't mean he's an impressive politician. He is an impressive politician, obviously, but he's, um, I, um, Kenneth Clark, who else did I say? Um, I, want you. I, 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 I think that's the best I can do. I'm, 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 I've am i been caught off guard. Who else? Um, goodness. There have just been so many, you know. Um, I, 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 I'm just, I'm just going to say Ken Clark because he's, he, Ken Clark has a very good interview style. And as, a, as an interviewer, it's always enjoyable to interview him because he comes up with funny lines. So I'm going to just say Ken Clark, but I... But, I, I appreciate that I'm going on the, the interview style rather than on the actual mm. politics. Well, for me, the first interview of yours that I ever watched uh, was on YouTube, and it was uh, the old interview of you with Robert Mugabe. And I don't know about him as the most impressive politician, but I definitely thought you handled that one uh, really well. And so next question, radio or TV? Radio. Why is that? <laughs> because TV has so much... There's so much crap that goes with TV of lights and cameras and makeup and waiting around for things to be put in place. So the kind of the actual effort that goes into TV, the, the effort that goes into the production as opposed to actually into the content of what you're saying is um, is massive. And radio is just so gloriously simple. As my old boss, Peter J, used to say, um, he was a Former, he was an economist. He's um, still alive. Peter's very elderly now, but very distinguished broadcaster and um, journalist. If you had the choice, don't ask me. Do I prefer TV or radio? Imagine you've got a TV, and I give you the choice. It's broken. You can either have the sound, or you can have the pictures, but you can't have them both. <laughs> You'd be mad not to take the sound. I mean, it's, pictures are are very secondary. Right. Other than, final question, other than yourself, who is your favorite BBC presenter? Um, I know many people have mistoke, mistaken you for Andrew Marr in the past, so we'll just put him to the side as well. So very, very, look, there are a lot of very good ones, so it is quite invidious to ask me that. I mean, I'm a very big fan of Justin Webb on the Today programme. Um, but they're all pretty good. Um, let's have a think. Who else would I say? Yeah, I, I sometimes think <clears throat> there are some very good presenters who are not kind of news news presenters, and I think they have a good start. I, I'm always driven to the kind of children's TV presenters. I actually, I'm, I'm struggling now to name name them, but often children's TV presenters 
show you how to really, really present. But I'll, uh, let me. Um, <laughs> it's a really, really tricky. Um, a very tricky one, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't know if I have a favourite presenter, Marty. And I'm sorry to sort of end on such an insipid note. Um, they all have their, they all have their styles. It's, uh, you go through the evening and mornings, the, I mean, there are people, uh, there are names I should, I, I, diplomatically, that would be right for me to give, but I, I, I know as soon as I give a name, I'm going to, I'm going to hurt someone else. But there are some very good presenters at the BBC. And I think you should think of it as an ecosystem of people with okay, different okay. styles. I'm different to Sarah Montague, who's different to Michelle Hussain, who's different to Nick Robinson, very different to Justin. Um, those are the kind of core radio ones. Again, very different to Emily Maitlis and Emma Barnett, who are the key Newsnight presenters. Uh, Andrew Marr, his own style. But put it this way. I like, uh, by and large, like presenters who are warm. Um, who are warm to them. That's my own taste in, in TV and radio. Someone who's, who's got a warmth. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably in that sort, of, that sort of space at the moment, <laughs> particularly now when there's so much grimness around. I always, I always feel I want someone who you could cuddle rather than who's going to throttle you um, if you encounter them. Um, I mean, obviously, this is quite an interesting week to be asking this because, in many ways, the most respected BBC presenter. Yes, Andrew Neil. Is was Andrew Neil, who is very brilliant, and very forensic, um, but he is no longer a BBC presenter. Or he actually is still a BBC <laughs> presenter, but he won't be for long. He's on his way out. Um, no, it's a good, good, a good set of questions. I would probably needed to to have thought about them in advance because there's so much politics and diplomacy to be involved in answering that. Well, a bit over 15 <laughs> seconds, but it was a delight to get an insight to how you assess these questions. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for joining us at the Politics Idea, and it was great to have you. Marty, it's been a great, great pleasure. I thank you all and have a great, um, well, good luck with everything, you know, really good luck. <clears throat> I certainly think uh, we will need it, but thank you all very, very much for joining us for this evening's event. It was the first one and I had an absolute blast. So I, I hope that you guys will all be able to say the same for yourselves. Uh, if you're only joining us for the first time, the Politics Society is the biggest political society at Sussex. And I could go on and on about uh, what we do, but I'm gonna just keep it short and sweet. And we put on events for you guys to enjoy, whether that's trips, socials, debates, or speaker events like this we do what we can to make your unique experience, your interaction with politics as good as it possibly can be, and to try and bring it to your level rather than uh, anything else really. And so before I leave you, I uh, would like to give a quick statement on behalf of the Vote From Abroad organization who reached out to us and wanted us to uh, just reach out to any US citizens or any people who know US citizens in the UK, just to let you know that if you are um, a US citizen or you know any and you are in the Brighton and Sussex region, uh, the Vote From Abroad organization aims to help US citizens living abroad to register, to vote, to request their ballots and to send them off and they can help answer any questions or doubts that you have about making sure uh, that your vote counts this November. And so whether you've never voted before or are a serial voter, um, seasonal voter, sorry, uh, they are here to help. And so please, don't be afraid to reach out for any questions and pass the message on to any US citizens you know. We'll be posting their website link and an email address that you can contact in the comment section below. So do keep an eye out for that and if that's something you are interested in. And that's uh, about it from me. I'd like to give a very big thanks to Bradley Stewart James and to Joe Matthews for helping uh, put this stream up and to make sure that uh, it ran swimmingly. A very big thanks to Evan once again and a very big thank you all of you for watching. We've got many more events coming up this term and next term, and they're open to everybody, whether you're a University of Sussex student or not. And so we hope we will see you there. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>